Section 5 of Myths and Legends This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy LaFaro, New South Wales, Australia. Myths and Legends of Ancient Greece and Rome by E. M. Behrens. Section 5 Third Dynasty Olympian Divinities Demeter and Aphrodite Demeter, Ceres Demeter, from Gemeta, Earth Mother, was the daughter of Cronus and Rhea. She represented that portion of Gaia, the whole solid earth, which we call the earth's crust, and which produces all vegetation. As goddess of agriculture, field fruits, plenty, and productiveness, she was the sustainer of material life, and was therefore a divinity of great importance. When ancient Gaia lost, when Uranus, her position as a ruling divinity, she abdicated her sway in favour of her daughter Rhea, who henceforth inherited the powers which her mother had previously possessed, receiving in her place the honour and worship of mankind. In a very old poem, Gaia is accordingly described as retiring to a cavern in the bowel of the earth, where she sits in the lap of her daughter, slumbering, moaning, and nodding for ever and ever. It is necessary to keep clearly in view the distinctive difference between the three great earth goddesses, Gaia, Rhea, and Demeter. Gaia represents the earth as a whole with its mighty subterranean forces. Rhea is that productive power which causes vegetation to spring forth, thus sustaining men and animals. Demeter, by presiding over agriculture, directs and utilizes Rhea's productive powers. But in later times, when Rhea, like other ancient divinity, loses her importance as a ruling deity, Demeter assumes all her functions and attributes, and then becomes the goddess of the life-producing and life-maintaining earth crust. We must bear in mind the fact that men in his primitive state knew neither how to sow nor how to till the ground. When, therefore, he had exhausted the pastures which surrounded him, he was compelled to seek others which were as yet unreaped. Thus, roaming constantly from one place to another, settled habitations, and consequently civilizing influences were possible. Demeter, however, by introducing a knowledge of agriculture, put an end, at once and forever, to that nomadic life which was now no longer necessary. The favor of Demeter was believed to bring mankind rich harvests and fruitful crops, whereas her displeasure caused blight drought and famine. The island of Sicily was supposed to be under her special protection, and there she was regarded with particular veneration. The Sicilians naturally attributing the wonderful fertility of their country to the partiality of the goddess. Demeter is usually represented as a woman of noble bearing and majesty appearance, tall, matronly, and dignified, with beautiful golden hair, which falls in rippling curls over her stately shoulders. The yellow locks being emblematical of the ripened ears of corn. Sometimes she appears seated in a chariot drawn by winged dragons. At others she stands erect, her figure drawn up to its full height, and always fully draped. She bears a sheaf of white ears in one hand, and a lighter torch in the other. The wheat ears are not unfrequently replaced by a bunch of poppies, in which her brows are also garlanded, though sometimes she merely wears a simple riband in her hair. Demeter, as the wife of Zeus, became the mother of Persephone, Proserpine, to whom she was so tenderly attached that her whole life was bound up in her, and she knew no happiness except in her society. One day, however, whilst Persephone was gathering flowers in a meadow, attended by the ocean nymphs, 
she saw to her surprise a beautiful narcissus, from the stem of which sprang forth a hundred blossoms. Drawing near to examine this lovely flower, whose exquisite scent perfumed the air, she stooped down to gather it, suspecting no evil. When a yawning abyss opened at her feet, and Adis, the grim ruler of the lower world, appeared from its depths, seated in his dazzling chariot drawn by four black horses. Regardless of her tears and the shrieks of her female attendants, Ada seized the terrified maiden and bore her away to the gloomy realms over which he reigned in melancholy grandeur. Helios, the all-seeing sun-god, and Hecate, a mysterious and very ancient divinity, alone heard her cries for aid, but were powerless to help her. When Demeter became conscious of her loss, her grief was intense, and she refused to be comforted. She knew not where to seek for her child, but feeling that repose and inaction were impossible, she set out on her weary search, taking with her two torches, which she lighted in the flames of Mount Etna, to guide her on her way. For nine long days and nights she wandered on, inquiring of every one she met for tidings of her child. But all was in vain. Neither gods nor men could give her the comfort which her soul so hungered for. At last, on the tenth day, the disconsolate mother met Hecate, who informed her that she had heard her daughter's cries, but knew not who it was that had borne her away. By Hecate's advice, Demeter consulted Helios, whose all-seeing eye nothing escapes, and from him she learned that it was Zeus himself who had permitted Aides to seize Persephone and transport her to the lower world in order that she might become his wife. Indignant with Zeus for having given his sanction to the abduction of his daughter, and, filled with the bitterest sorrow, she abandoned her home in Olympus, and refused all heavenly food. Disguising herself as an old woman, she descended upon earth, and commenced a weary pilgrimage among mankind. One evening she arrived at a place called Eleusis, in Attica, and sat down to rest herself near a well beneath the shade of an olive tree. The youthful daughters of Celius, the king of the country, came with their pails of brass to draw water from this well, and seeing that the tired waferer appeared faint and dispirited, they spoke kindly to her, asking who she was and whence she came. Demeter replied that she had made her escape from pirates who had captured her, and added that she would feel grateful for a home with any worthy family whom she would be willing to serve in a menial capacity. The princesses, on hearing this, begged Demeter to have a moment's patience while they returned home and consulted with their mother, Matanera. They soon brought the joyful intelligence that she was desirous of securing her services as nurse to her infant son, Demophoon, or Triptolemus. When Demeter arrived at the house, a radiant light suddenly illuminated her, which circumstance so overawed Matanera that she treated the unknown stranger with the greatest respect, and hospitality offered her food and drink. But Demeter, still grief-worn and dejected, refused her kindly offers, and held herself apart from the social board. At length, however, the maid-servant Iambi succeeded, by means of playful jests and merriment, in somewhat dispelling the grief of the sorrowing mother, causing her at times to smile in spite of herself, and even inducing her to partake of a mixture of barley meal, mint, and water, which was prepared according to the directions of the goddess herself. Time passed on, and the young child throve amazingly under the care of his kind and judicious nurse, who, however, gave him no food, but anointed him daily with ambrosia, and every night laid him secretly in the fire, in order to render him immortal and exempt from old age. But unfortunately this benevolent design on the part of Demeter was frustrated by Metaniera herself, whose curiosity one night impelled her to watch the proceedings 
of the mysterious being who nursed her child. When to her horror she beheld her son placed in the flames, she shrieked aloud. Demeter, incensed at this untimely interruption, instantly withdrew the child, and throwing him on the ground revealed herself in her true character. The bent and aged form had vanished, and in its place there stood a bright and beauteous being, whose golden locks streamed over her shoulders in richest luxuriance, her whole aspect bespeaking dignity and majesty. She told the awestruck Metaniera that she was the goddess Demeter, and had intended to make her son immortal, but that her fatal curiosity had rendered this impossible, adding, however, that the child, having slept in her arms, and been nursed on her lap, should ever command the respect and esteem of mankind. She then desired that a temple and altar should be erected to her on a neighbouring hill by the people of Eleusis, promising that she herself would direct them how to perform the sacred rites and ceremonies which should be observed in her honour. With these words she took her departure never to return. Obedient to her commands, Celius called together a meeting of his people, and built the temple on the spot which the goddess had indicated. It was soon completed, and Demeter took up her abode in it. But her heart was still sad for the loss of her daughter, and the whole world felt the influence of her grief and dejection. This was indeed a terrible year for mankind. Demeter no longer smiled on the earth. She was wont to bless. And though the husbandman sowed the grain, and the groaning oxen ploughed the fields, no harvest rewarded their labour. All was barren, dreary desolation. The world was threatened with famine, and the gods, with the loss of their accustomed honours and sacrifices, it became evident, therefore, to Zeus himself, that some measures must be adopted to appease the anger of the goddess. He accordingly dispatched Iris and many of the other gods and goddesses to implore Demeter to return to Olympus, but all their prayers were fruitless. The incensed goddess swore that until her daughter was restored to her, she would not allow the grain to spring forth from the earth. At length Zeus sent Hermes, his faithful messenger, to the lower world with a petition to Aedes, urgently entreating him to restore Persephone to the arms of her disconsolate mother. When he arrived in the gloomy realms of Aedes, Hermes found him seated on a throne with the beautiful Persephone beside him, sorrowfully bewailing her unhappy fate. On learning his errand, Aedes consented to resign Persephone who joyfully prepared to follow the messenger of the gods to the abode of life and light. Before taking leave of her husband, he presented to her a few seeds of pomegranate, which in her excitement she thoughtlessly swallowed, and this simple act, as the sequel will show, materially affected her whole future life. The meeting between mother and child was one of unmixed rapture and for the moment all the past was forgotten. The loving mother's happiness would now have been complete, had not Aedes asserted his rights. These were that if any mortal had tasted food in his realms, they were bound to remain there for ever. Of course, the ruler of the lower world had to prove this assertion. This, however, he found no difficulty in doing. As Ascalaphus, the son of Acheron and Orphne, was his witness to the fact, Zeus, pitying the disappointment of Demeter at finding her hopes thus blighted, succeeded in effecting a compromise by inducing his brother Aedes to allow Persephone to spend six months of the year with the gods above, whilst during the other six she was to be the joyless companion of her grim lord below. Accompanied by her daughter, the beautiful Persephone, Demeter now resumed her long-abandoned dwelling in Olympus. The sympathetic earth responded gaily to her bright smiles. 
the corn at once sprang forth from the ground in fullest plenty the trees which late were sad and bare now donned their brightest emerald robes and the flowers so long imprisoned in the hard dry soil filled the whole air with their fragrant perfume thus ends this charming story which was a favourite theme with all the classic authors it is very possible that the poets who first created this graceful myth merely intended it as an allegory to illustrate the change of seasons in the course of time however a literal meaning became attached to this and similar poetical fancies and thus the people of greece came to regard as an article of religious belief what in the first instance was nothing more than a poetic simile in the temple erected to demeter at eleusis the famous eleusinian mysteries were instituted by the goddess herself it is exceedingly difficult as in the case of all secret societies to discover anything with certainty concerning these sacred rites the most plausible supposition is that the doctrines taught by the priests to the favoured few whom they initiated were religious truths which were deemed unfit for the uninstructed mind of the multitude for instance it is supposed that the myth of demeter and persephone was explained by the teachers of the mysteries to signify the temporary loss which mother earth sustains every year when the icy breath of winter robs her of her flowers and fruits and grain it is believed that in later times a still deeper meaning was conveyed by this beautiful myth viz the doctrine of the immortality of the soul the grain which as it were remains dead for a time in the dark earth only to rise one day dressed in a newer and lovelier garb was supposed to symbolize the soul which after death frees itself from corruption to live again under a better and purer form when demeter instituted the eleusinian mysteries Celius and his family were the first to be initiated Celius himself being appointed high priest his son triptolemus and his daughters who acted as priestesses assisted him in the duties of his sacred office the mysteries were celebrated by the athenians every five years and were for a long time their exclusive privilege they took place by torchlight and were conducted with the greatest solemnity in order to spread abroad the blessings which agriculture confers demeter presented triptolemus with her chariot drawn by winged dragons and giving him some grains of corn desired him to journey through the world teaching mankind the arts of agriculture and husbandry demeter exercised great severity towards those who incurred her displeasure we find examples of this in the stories of stelio and eresicthon stelio was a youth who ridiculed the goddess for the eagerness with which she was eating a bowl of porridge when weary and faint in the vain search for her daughter resolved that he should never again have an opportunity of thus offending she angrily threw into his face the remainder of the food and changed him into a spotted lizard eresicthon son of triopas had drawn upon himself the anger of demeter by cutting down her sacred groves for which she punished him with a constant and insatiable hunger he sold all his possessions in order to satisfy his cravings and was forced at last to devour his own limbs his daughter metra who was devotedly attached to him possessed the power of transforming herself into a variety of different animals by this means she contrived to support her father who sold her again and again each time she assumed a different form and thus he dragged on a pitiful existence ceres the roman ceres is actually the greek demeter under another name her attributes worship festivals etc being precisely identical 
The Romans were indebted to Sicily for this divinity, her worship having been introduced by the Greek colonists who settled there. The Cerelia, or festivals in honour of Ceres, commenced on the 12th of April, and lasted several days. Aphrodite, Venus Aphrodite, from Aphros, Sea Foam, and Dite, issued. The daughter of Zeus and a sea nymph, called Dione, was the goddess of love and beauty. Dione, being a sea nymph, gave birth to her daughter beneath the waves, but the child of the heaven inhabiting Zeus was forced to ascend from the ocean depths and mount to the snow-capped summits of Olympus, in order to breathe that ethereal and most refined atmosphere which pertains to the celestial gods. Aphrodite was the mother of Eros, Cupid, the god of love, also of Aeneas, the great Trojan hero, and the head of that Greek colony which settled in Italy, and from which arose the city of Rome. As a mother, Aphrodite claims our sympathy for the tenderness she exhibits towards her children. Homer tells us in his Iliad how, when Aeneas was wounded in battle, she came to his assistance, regardless of personal danger, and was herself severely wounded in attempting to save his life. Aphrodite was tenderly attached to a lovely youth called Adonis, whose exquisite beauty has become proverbial. He was a motherless babe, and Aphrodite, taking pity on him, placed him in a chest and entrusted him to the care of Persephone, who became so fond of the beautiful youth that she refused to part with him. Zeus, being appealed to by the rival foster-mothers, decided that Adonis should spend four months of every year with Persephone, four with Aphrodite, whilst during the remaining four months he should be left to his own devices. He became, however, so attached to Aphrodite that he voluntarily devoted to her the time at his own disposal. Adonis was killed, during the chase, by a wild boar, to the great grief of Aphrodite, who bemoaned his loss so persistently that Aides, moved with pity, permitted him to pass six months of every year with her, whilst the remaining half of the year was spent by him in the lower world. Aphrodite possessed a magic girdle, the famous Cestus, which she frequently lent to unhappy maidens suffering from the pangs of unrequited love, as it was endowed with the power of inspiring affection for the wearer, whom it invested with every attribute of grace, beauty, and fascination. Her usual attendants are the charities or graces, Euphrosyne, Aglaia, and Thalia, who are represented undraped and intertwined in a loving embrace. In Hesiod's Theogony she is supposed to belong to the more ancient divinities, and whilst those of later date are represented as having descended one from another, and all more or less from Zeus. Aphrodite has a variously accounted for yet independent origin. The most poetical version of her birth is that when Uranus was wounded by his son Cronus, his blood mingled with the foam of the sea, whereupon the bubbling waters at once assumed a rosy tint, and from their depths arose in all the surpassing glory of her loveliness Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty. Shaking her long fair tresses, the water drops rolled down into the beautiful seashell in which she stood, and became transformed into pure glistening pearls. Wafted by the soft and balmy breezes, she floated on to Cythera, and was thence transported to the island of Cyprus. Lightly she stepped on shore and under the gentle pressure of her delicate foot the dry and rigid sand became transformed into a verdant meadow where every varied shade of colour and every sweet odour charmed the senses 
the whole island of Cyprus became clothed in verdure, and greeted this fairest of all created beings with a glad smile of friendly welcome. Here she was received by the seasons, who decked her with garments of immortal fabric, encircling her fair brow with a wreath of purest gold, whilst from her ears depended costly rings, and a glittering chain embraced her swan-like throat. And now, arrayed in all her panoply of her irresistible charms, the nymphs escort her to the dazzling halls of Olympus, where she is received with ecstatic enthusiasm by the admiring gods and goddesses. The gods all vied with each other in aspiring to the honour of her hand. But Hephaestus became the envied possessor of this lovely being, who, however, proved as faithless as she was beautiful, and caused her husband much unhappiness, owing to the preference she showed at various times for some of the other gods, and also for mortal men. The celebrated Venus of Milo, now in the Louvre, is an exquisite statue of this divinity. The head is beautifully formed. The rich waves of hair descend on her rather low but broad forehead, and are caught up gracefully in a small knot at the back of the head. The expression of the face is most bewitching, and bespeaks the perfect joyousness of a happy nature combined with the dignity of a goddess. The drapery falls in careless folds from the waist downwards, and her whole attitude is the embodiment of all that is graceful and lovely in womanhood. She is of medium height, and the form is perfect in its symmetry and faultless proportions. Aphrodite is also frequently represented in the act of confining her dripping locks in a knot, whilst her attendant nymphs envelop her in a gauzy veil. The animals sacred to her were the dove, swan, swallow, and sparrow. Her favourite plants were the myrtle, apple tree, rose, and poppy. The worship of Aphrodite is supposed to have been introduced into Greece from Central Asia. There is no doubt that she was originally identical with the famous Astarte, the Ashtoreth of the Bible against whose idolatrous worship and infamous rites the prophets of old hurled forth their sublime and powerful anathemas. End of section 5